Okay, here we go. Uh, today should feel a little bit challenging. Um, it's going to press your memory for what you remember throughout uh, trigonometry so far. It went fine during third hour, but without a doubt, some people felt stretched. Um, we're going to do our best to keep it as concise and easy as possible, but uh, you got to bring your A game today. So this is definitely a, a point where people start losing points on the test. Okay, this is this is where the struggles start to begin. Okay, so uh, for me, this is one of the most exciting lessons of the year. I think that what we're showing you today, to me, when I saw it, I was like, that's amazing. You know what I mean? That when I saw this when I was in high school, I was like, well, this, I mean, these were the things I was like, I will definitely be a math major because this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. You know what I mean, that's kind of where I was at. So I understand that for some of you, that may not be the same level of enthusiasm, and that's okay. No judgment on my part. Ready? Today we're going to multiply and divide complex numbers. And we're going to write these numbers as follows. Suppose that z sub 1, that's a complex number, is in trigonometric form. And that trigonometric form is r sub 1 times cosine of theta sub 1 plus i sine of theta sub 1. So I just expressed a complex number in trigonometric form, which was what we were supposed to do yesterday. I know that basically all of you have that assignment done and checked, which is excellent. Way to go. And we'll also say that z sub 2 is equal to r sub 2 times cosine of theta sub 2 plus i sine of theta sub 2. Are you okay with those two different trig numbers? Okay, so what I want to do is I want to see how I can multiply those and I can divide them. So yesterday we learned how to take these things and place them in a trig form. Now we're going to perform operations with them. We're going to do three operations today. The first two are multiply and divide. If I take z sub 1 and multiply z sub 2, um, it's actually quite simple. All I do is I take r sub 1 and multiply it by r sub 2. And then I have this cosine and sine stuff. And I'm going to have to do something with the theta values. And it turns out I just add them together. So it's cosine of theta sub 1 plus theta sub 2 plus i sine of theta sub 1 plus theta sub 2. Somebody asked a really good question during second hour uh, or third hour. They said, why is that true? And I said, we would have to show you the proof in order to show you why. Uh, we don't have the time for that. And it occurred to me, I don't actually know the proof. I don't. Um, rarely do I come across those situations. I haven't done that one before. So just got to memorize the formula. Uh, if you're really interested in proof, come and see me and we'll make up a plan. Z sub 1 divided by Z sub 2. Who wants to guess what I do with the R values when I'm dividing? I do divide them. So R sub 1 over R sub 2. Does anybody want to guess what I do with the theta values? I do subtract them. So the cosine of theta sub 1 minus theta sub 2 plus I sine of theta sub 1 minus theta sub 2. Uh, another person made an excellent comment saying, who made this stuff up? Well, that again, um, you have to remember math was not made up. Math is a truth that we discover. So um, this represents the way in which our world exists. So, um, so this is not made up. Nobody decided to just make this up. This is, a, this is a universal truth. So here we go. Let's multiply these two together. Z sub 1 times Z sub 2. Let me go back up. Okay, Z sub 1 times Z sub 2. Notice that Z sub 1 is 2 times the cosine of pi over 4 plus I sine of pi over 4. And z sub 2 is 5 times the cosine of pi over 3 plus i sine of pi over 3. All we want to do is we want to multiply those together and we want to divide them. So who can tell me where to start? You're smart kids. The r's, what do I do with them? So I get 10 times the cosine of... What is pi over 4 plus pi over 3? Good, so you see 45 and 60. We're going to leave it in radians. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go, uh, we're going to create common denominators. So 3 pi over 12 
plus 4 pi over 12, 7 pi over 12. That's all. I'm going to argue not that bad. Now I'm going to divide them. Anybody? Two fifths. Ella's got her A game today. Co sign up. Good, negative pi over 12 plus I sine of negative pi over 12. You cannot do that. You can't leave the negative of an angle. Who remembers what happens to the cosine of a negative angle? So we have 2 over 5 cosine of pi over 12. And as you guys said, good job, Morgan, minus I sine of pi over 12. For sine, the negative moves out front. For cosine, it disappears. Um, Excellent job. You've shown you are excellent mathematicians. So However, yes, yes. So the better question is why? Why does the cosine of a negative go away? Why does the sine of a negative go up front? Who remembers? Because you learn that cosine is an even function, and for even functions, like x squared, it doesn't matter whether you plug in a positive or a negative, you get the same output. So cosine is an even function, whereas sine is an odd function, so you get the opposite. That's why, even and odd. I bring that up because it was a uh, question on one of your recent ACT packets. So maybe notice that. Flip it over. So I told you we were going to do three things today. Uh, we learned to multiply, we learned to divide, and now we do de Mauvray's theorem. De Mauvray was a mathematician. Uh, after that of Leonard Euler, I brought to you guys yesterday, Leonard Euler, one of the four greatest minds to ever walk the face of the earth. Tragically, he lost his eyesight at an earlier age, I believe in his 40s, and he was struggling to keep up mathematically. And this is why he even writes that some of his greatest work was never, ever published, not because um, he was uh, in, in, unable to write so much as um, because he was blind, he would he would kind of dictate his his words to people, and they would write it down. You know what I mean? But he couldn't find another human being that was smart enough to take his notes. They just never really understood everything that he was trying to do. You know what I mean? And so much of his work, uh, his he argues some of his better work later in life was never even discovered. So um, De Maveri came after that. He just formalized a little bit of uh, Euler's work, but. Euler, one of the two greats. I will show you one that the most uh, impressive part of Euler, one of the most impressive parts of Euler's work. He comes up with this uh, this piece, e to the i pi uh, minus, or I'm sorry, plus one happens to be equal to zero, and it, it's it's amazing. This this is an equation that can be shown to be true. And if you think about just the the important numbers in life, e has that been important? Is i important? Is the number pi important? Is the number one important? And is the number zero? Some people could argue those are the five most important numbers in all mathematics. There is an equation that actually expresses them to all be true. Um, it's ridiculous how it comes up. I could show you after you take calculus. Um, yeah, maybe I'll actually do that. We'll plan that, Marissa. Remind me, Marissa. Okay. All right. Remind me. Okay. Okay. We're doing that May 17th, right before you guys graduate. We'll show you how that happens. Very good. All right. Here we go. Got some planning done in the process. De Maveri's theorem says the following. Suppose you want to take z and raise it to the n power. I'm going to take a complex number and raise it to the n power. Who can tell me what you think I do with r? Yes, you raise r to the n power. What do you think I do with the theta values? You multiply them by n. And that is de Maveri's theorem. And it allows us to do things that are absolutely remarkable. 
Uh, Z is R times co uh, cosine of theta plus I sine of theta. Okay, so we have three examples. This is going to be, you know, a little bit challenging to get through. Uh, you're going to see some things that uh, will just kind of press your mind in terms of fractions and powers and things like that. But look at the last problem we want to do. This is totally fun. 1 minus I to the 100th power. Um, if somebody would like to start right now and see if you could beat us by the time we get to this, you got about a half an hour. See how you can do. Okay. All right. Gavin says accepted. He's going to start multiplying that 100 times. We'll see where you get, Gav. Uh, we're going to do this. It'll take us about uh, three and a half minutes to do. It'll be no big deal at all. So uh, let's start here. Uh, we want to take this and raise it to the 10th power. And in order to do so, the first step is that we're going to first turn it into trigonometric form. And in order to do that, we need r and we need theta. So what's nice about this lesson is it builds on what we did yesterday. Everybody see that? So let's work on what we did yesterday. How do we determine r again? Good. Square root of a squared plus b squared. What is one half squared and one half squared? Yep, one fourth plus one fourth, which is the square root of one half, or one over the root of two, or root of two over two. Are y'all okay with that? Okay. Now let's produce the theta value. How do you determine theta? This is from yesterday. Tangent of theta is equal to what? Does not have to do with R, has to do with something here. B over A, which is? Uh, B over A, yeah, B over A. One. Tangent of theta is equal to 1. Yes. So let's talk about what Luke is doing. He uh, says tangent is positive in the first and the third quadrant. How do we know when there, we're the first quadrant and not the third quadrant? If you were to graph this point, it would place you in the first quadrant. Does everybody see that? Okay. So we know we're in the first quadrant. Luke inverses 1 for tangent. He comes up with 45 degrees and then converts 45 degrees to radians. So therefore, theta is equal to pi over 4. So therefore, the trigonometric form of this complex number is the r value, or root of 2 over 2, times the cosine of pi over 4, plus I sine of pi over 4. All I've done is what we did yesterday. I turned it into trigonometric form. What is the problem now asking me to do? Take it to the 10th power. Yeah. Okay. What does de Mavre's theorem tell us about how to take this stuff to the 10th power? What do we do with this? Yeah, and we'll have to get back to that because, you know, taking the root of 2 over 2 to the 10th power is uh, challenging sometimes for people. We'll talk about that in a second. And then we have times cosine of, what do we do with the angle? And what is pi over 4 times 10? I don't want to talk about degrees. I'd like to work in radians. 10 pi over 4. Yep, and since I write it twice, I'm going to do what Morgan said, which is we have cosine 10 pi over 4 plus I sine. And you can see you can reduce that to 5 pi over 2. Okay. Now, we have a little bit of cleaning up here to do in this problem. Uh, first of all, I'm going to deal with the angle. Does everybody agree that 5 pi over 2 is more than once around the circle? So we can't do more than once around the circle. You have to make sure that your angle is expressed between 0 and 2 pi. Okay. So how much is once around the circle? 2 pi or 360, right? 
So 2 pi, I'm going to subtract 2 pi off of that. So um, 5 pi over 2 minus 2 pi. So how do we do 5 pi over 2 minus 2 pi? Yeah. Good. So four, 5 pi over 2 minus 4 pi over 2. What is 5 pi over 2 minus 4 pi over 2? Just pi over 2, right? So don't write this down, but just so you understand what we did, watch, watch the turning of my angle. 1 pi over 2, 2 pi over 2. 3 pi over 2, 4 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2. That is the angle of 5 pi over 2, which is the same as just pi over 2. Agreed? That is what we just went through. Everybody got that? Okay. So good. You're almost there. You're doing very well. You're a very intelligent class. So I'm going to write cosine of pi over 2 plus I sine of pi over 2. So we've got that piece taken care of. But now I have this awkward thing, which is the root of 2 over 2 to the 10th power. Let's talk about trying to simplify that just a little bit. This will bring you back to your algebra days. Uh, the root of 2, how could I write that with an exponent? The square root of 2 is the same as 2 to what power? Right, so you have 2 to the 1 half on top, and you have 2 to the 1 on the bottom. That's raised to the 10th. What happens when you have a power to a power? You multiply, so what's 1 half times 10? So on the top, you're going to have 2 to the 5th, right? And the bottom, you're going to have 2 to the... 10th. What is 2 to the 5th over 2 to the 10th? That would be 1 over 2 to the 5th? Yes, we, we subtract the exponents. And 2 to the 5th is 32. So you get 1 over 32. For your assignment, you must list both the trigonometric form and the complex form. So we've just done trig form. Complex form is just one more step. It's no big deal. Who can tell me what the cosine of pi over 2 is? Pi over 2 is 90 degrees. That's not the cosine. Cosine of, of pi over 2 is 0. What's the sine of pi over 2? And 1 times i is i. So notice in this problem, you get 1 32nd times i, which is 1 over 32i. And that is your complex form. So what we just did is, using De Mavre's theorem, we took this thing to the 10th power. Now, some of you guys might be like, well, I could have tried multiplying that out by 10 times. Sure, go ahead. See if you can get everything to cancel to come out with just 1 over 32 pi. In this situation, uh, even re more ridiculous to go to the 100th power. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you got, Gab? Oh, okay, all right, good. Good call, good call. Uh, Lisa doesn't believe you. Okay, all right. She doesn't believe you. All right. So now we have 1 plus i raised to 3 raised to the 20th power. Let's make sure we get through these last two examples. Um, so I notice how the i is sitting back here. It really should be sitting in front. I just rewrote it to help you see that. Uh, I need to first put it into trigonometric form. So help me uh, move along. What do, I, what do I do? Square root of 1 plus 3, we do not include the i. So I get square root of 4, which is 2. Good. That was pretty straightforward. Now what? Tangent of theta is equal to root of 3 over 1. So root of 3. Which quadrant are we working in? The first quadrant, according to if you were to graph that point, you'd be in the first quadrant. Somebody uh, inverse the tangent of Yep, 60, which is pi over 3. So theta is 60 degrees, otherwise known as pi over 3 radians. So we just put it into trig form. 
2 times the cosine of pi over 3 plus i sine of pi over 3. You guys are smart. Great. I did the first step. What is it that we want to do with that expression? We want to raise it to the 20th power. Can somebody tell me how I do that? Because it sounds ridiculous. Yep, 2 to the 20th times which is 20 pi over 3. Is 20 pi over 3 more than once around the circle? Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely more than once, right? So, uh 2 pi is the same as what over 3? 6 pi over 3, right? So as we subtract 2 pi off of 2 pi or 20 pi over 3, we'll subtract that 6 pi over 3. Everybody got that? So 20 pi over 3 minus 6 pi over 3. 14 pi over 3. Is that more than once around the circle? Yeah. Let's subtract it again. 8 pi over 3, is that still more than once around the circle? Subtract it again and you get 2 pi over 3. So we have 2 to the 20th times the cosine of 2 pi over 3 plus i sine of 2 pi over 3. And that is trig form. I don't really want to write out 2 to the 20th power, do you? That's a large number. Let's leave it expressed in a smaller fashion. Now I need to turn it into complex form. So I need to figure out the cosine of 2 pi over 3. Uh, 2 pi over 3 is 120 degrees. You're, you're right there. But the question is, at 120 degrees, so if we're at 120 degrees, what is that coordinate right there? Negative 1 half, root of 3 over 2. Good work. And so cosine which would, would be which value? It would be negative one half plus i roots of three over two. And nothing really cancels if we were to multiply that through, so we'll just leave it. But that would be one way to write it. Can I show you another way to write it? If I distributed this through, it would be a two to the twentieth on top, wouldn't it? And it would be a two on the bottom, a two to the first. What is 2 to the 20th divided by 2 to the 1st? Try it again. 2 to the 20th divided by 2 to the 1st. 2 to the 19th, right? So the way that this is commonly written in this situation would be negative 2 to the 19th uh, plus uh, i 2 to the 19th roots of 3. So that's another way to write it. I would accept either or. Are we good with that? Yeah, I'm sure you don't want to. Okay, we probably need it more than he does, so we're going to go ahead and uh, we'll see if our answer matches what Gavin has. Gavin, just out of curiosity, how long did it take you? Was it was it like three and a half minutes? Five minutes. Okay, got it. All right, all right. Yeah, it's to the hundred. If it was a thousand, probably would have been probably six minutes then, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right. So, what is R in this situation? Square root of 2. And then tangent of theta is equal to negative 1. So which quadrant are we working in in this situation? This is definitely the fourth quadrant, isn't it? And if you inverse the tangent of 1 on your calculator, you get 45. Which means this is what angle here? 315. Does anybody remember what 315 is in radians? 7 pi over 4. So theta is equal to 7 pi over 4. It's part of what I love about this unit or this lesson is the number of things that we're asked to recall from the beginning of our trigonometry time. It's a good review. 
Okay, so there we have the root of 2. We have 7 pi over 4. So I'm going to have root of 2 times the cosine of 7 pi over 4 plus I sine of 7 pi over 4. And what do we want to do with that? Take it to the 100th power, which Gavin did. Took him five minutes. So what do we do to the root of 2? Yeah, anybody know a different way to write the root of 2 to the 100th power? Close. This is 2 to the 1 half, right? What's 2 to the 1 half to the 100th? 2 to the 50th? Times the cosine of, and what do you get if you take 7 pi over 4 times 100? Excellent. 700 pi over 4. Luke, if you take 700 pi and divide it by 4, what do you get? 175 pi is what you get. Would you guys agree that 175 pi is more than once around the circle? Okay, some people, uh, third hour, kind of struggled with why I was doing this. Um, there's just there's different ways to think about it. I want to show you a quick way of, of doing it. I don't want to subtract 2 pi over and over and over again. That seems like a lot of work, doesn't it? So please watch me. This is 0. That's 1 pi. That's 2 pi. That's 3 pi. That's 4 pi. That's 5 pi. Do you see that all the even pies are over here? All the odd ones are over here? So therefore, 175 pi is going to be the same as? Just pi. Right? Yeah. So there we have it. 2 to the 50th times the cosine of pi plus I sine of pi. That is trig form. finalize our lesson for the day and to see if we match Gavin's answer we will place this into complex form what is the cosine of pi negative one and what is the sine of pi times I would be zero so if notice if we distribute the two to the 50th through or just negative one plus zero is negative one you get negative two raised to the 50th power and that is complex form. So, Gab, just to be clear, we're saying our answer is it's not negative 2 to the 50th. We're going uh, negative quantity 2 to the 50th. That's what we're saying. Did that match what you got? Good, good. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Was anybody else worried there? Now, I understand that everybody's different. I understand that uh, uh, you know everybody has different interests. And I don't expect you to love this as much as I do necessarily, but I do expect this. I, I hope that you can appreciate that instead of multiplying that out 100 times, which seems absolutely nuts, in just this amount of space we are able to calculate, you just take 2 to the 50th and make it negative. That's all it is. That's, you know, kind of cool. So... Anyway, that's that. You are now ready to do your assignment, which was kind of the next one in your booklet, case okay, it's the one we skipped over yesterday, which is de Mavre's theorem. Uh, so you're going to multiply, you're going to divide, just like we did today, and uh, then you're going to do those de Mavre's theorem problems. You definitely have work for this weekend. Um, I would highly, highly encourage you folks to come to Monday, um, making sure that you have a good start on the uh, lesson so far. If you have not yet done solving uh, trig equations, um, you are behind. Okay? So that was the first one, right? Your first I one. Okay? The second one, um, <laughs> need to get caught up on that. People do struggle with solving trig equations on the test, not going to lie. Yesterday was placing complex numbers in trigonometric form. Hopefully, you are done with that. You're going to have seven assignments during this unit. We've already had four. So right now I've scheduled next Friday. I struggle to think that we're actually going to get next Friday in. 
So Tuesday is the ACT, and then Wednesday is a virtual day. So I don't believe we'll be able to make Friday. I believe it'll be the following Tuesday. Oh, I believe that you guys will be here and they, or we'll be, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't been told yet. I don't know where we'll be.